This is Hawaii's last secret island. Literally as far as you can possibly go in the Hawaiian island chain and still be legally allowed to go spearfishing. Multiple 20 pounders on the boat. It took me a flight and 17 hours on a boat to make it to this point right here. And we are just getting ready to jump in the water for the first time. I've looked at this spot on the chart for years, literally studying the satellite imagery of the reef and the rocks and the Google Earth and I'm beyond excited to finally have made it right here to this moment. Almost nobody makes it to this island right here because not only is it so far from shore, but the waters surrounding it are always so rough. And to make such a long journey, you need a really crazy weather window, which guys, we have right now. We've got four days to explore this island. We're gonna be all around it, diving, fishing, trolling, deep dropping, dropping the jigs, diving it at night, just totally seeing whatever this place has to offer. I'm about to get in the water right now for the first time. I'm gonna see it while you guys are seeing it because I have no idea what's gonna be down there, but we're gonna see you in the water. After traveling for 17 hours by boat, this is the first thing I saw as I rolled over the side. I was in like 120 feet of water, just jumping in just to see what was there. Schools of rainbow runners, giant massive schools of these black papillos that we never see anywhere. Aluas cruising along the bottom. Just unbelievable amount of life and this is truly what dreams are made of. The pelagic life was incredible but my first drop to the bottom kind of sealed for me that this was going to be a reef hunting expedition of my dreams. A knife jaws cruising along the bottom that you never see. Big schools of moo everywhere uhus to apes, just everything that you kind of would expect at the best spearfishing spot you've ever been to, but more of it, bigger of it, and dumber. Just everything in your face, big schools of those joe, goats, those munus, just stuff everywhere. Guys, I cannot tell you how I felt at this exact moment knowing that I had three more full days of spearfishing right here. And to top it all off, on my way up, I saw my first glimpse of the Hawaiian monk seal, which is known to inhabit this area, a lot of them, and I've never actually seen one in the water, but for the entire rest of the trip, these guys would follow us around underwater and play peekaboo, and it was just absolutely incredible. We started the day off right at this unbelievable cave that just broke off into like this sheer rock wall and went just as deep underwater as it did like back into the mountain. Like this is a hundred something feet deep right here and I'm literally in a cave. Sharks were everywhere, the monk seal kept following us in here. It was truly some of the coolest diving that I've ever done in my entire life without even trying to spearfish anything. Just swimming around and exploring what the ocean had to offer in this pristine area was some of the coolest diving I've ever done in my entire life. We didn't travel all day and night though, just to look at fish. So when Blake got to the bottom and this kumu showed up out of nowhere, he was like, first blood, done, you're coming home with me. Blake got the next fish as well with this beautiful moo cruising across the bottom. You'll see how he's down there, he's posted up, he's hidden, and then as that moo comes across, he's gonna do a little lunge till he gets in within range, he's gonna pull the trigger and he lands another beautiful fish for the start of this trip. 
we really didn't know what to expect on this adventure. You know, we didn't know if it was going to be a lot of pelagic stuff or a lot of reef stuff. But one of the things that we're always looking for, our number one target anywhere, is ukus. And me and Blake went back and forth. We're like always looking for that 40 pound uku out here, especially in this end of the world zone. This wasn't a 40 pounder, but this was one of the first of a few 20 pounders that we're gonna get on this trip. Again, Blake nailed another beautiful cheek meat shot in an epic fish. And then on his way up, he said, there's two more down there. Get down there, go see if you can get one. I wasn't able to find the two that Blake saw. They kind of got out of there. But as the day went on, this was actually the first time I pulled the trigger this day and only the only time that I'm gonna pull the trigger this entire day. We got in the water like three, four o'clock and we dove all the way till absolute sunset. And I see this a lot, especially diving out here in Hawaii, that I, I really enjoy that afternoon dive because I don't wanna get out until the last second, until the, the very, very end of the day because so much comes out and is feeding and is alive. Like this uku, you guys can see how dark it is. This is like last light and everything is just out cruising around. Those omilus, that big uku up there. And they he did exactly what he's supposed to do with a couple grunts and some scratching, came in within range of that new heavy spear gun with that single carbon roller. He was able to come in, call him in and get a beautiful shot on an epic first fish of a truly unbelievable trip, guys. You do not understand, I've got two more epic days of footage coming. Unbelievable first drift here out here in paradise. Guys, it was exactly what I was kind of dreaming of. Seals all over the place, following you around on the bottom. We only got two beautiful uku, but what's kind of, what was kind of shocking was we saw a lot of the same fish that we see on all our other islands. So we saw like the Moanakalis and the Kumus, and there were, there, we would have thought that there'd be either more or bigger, but instead there were just, there was a, just like normal, there was like a Kumu there, there was like a Moanakali, but everything was definitely stuffed and there was a lot more life overall. Bait everywhere all across the water. So we picked up this two Uku. Now we're deep dropping all night, Mempachi fishing, hanging out here. We're gonna drop the drift sock so we can stay right here in the same area so that we're able to dive again out here in the morning all day long. I think tomorrow we're gonna focus more on that blue water, drop the flasher, drop the chum, and kind of see what else we can pull up off the bottom. Maybe drop some chum down deep and see if we can't pull some giant ukus up from super deep. What do you see, Blake? It's just a pile. Look at all. It's just a pile are those, of rainbow runners. Are those rainbow runners? There is so much life. So last night we literally dropped the hook on this exposed reef that came all the way out here like three miles offshore. There is no land anywhere around us. Guys, woke up to birds absolutely everywhere. Fish jumping all around us. I just got suited up. The sun has just come up. And guys, it's time to get in again. We're gonna see you guys in the water. This video is brought to you by RMX Merch. If you enjoy our videos and wanna help us make more, go buy some. It makes a perfect gift for the RMX fan in your life. These designs will never be seen again, so go get them before they're gone. So the plan was always to kind of throw the sea anchor in the middle of the night and just let it drift, keep someone on watch and kind of, you know, cause there's really no anchorage out here where we were going and it's just blue water. But there was one high spot that came up to like 30, 40 feet below the surface. And at about one o'clock in the morning when we were done fishing, we were like, let's just throw the anchor and see if we can snag it. And I can't believe it, but first try we snagged this thing and we stayed up and we checked it out and, and it was good. And in the morning we woke up and we popped the anchor right off, no problem. And, and then we were right in the zone that we wanted to be. So the plan was to fish that high spot, but to do that with a lot of current, we wanna set up way in front of it with a bunch of chum. So we're doing this first drift of the day, totally relaxing, dropping those chum chunks down. It's like 170, 180 feet right here. And I decided let's do a deep one and see what's down there. And I get down there about to, you know, I think this is like 120 something, 125, which was my first dive of the day after rolling out of bed. And there's a big, beautiful uku down there cruising back and forth, just eating those chunks. You'll see how I'm really slow and relaxed. I'm not really approaching him. I'm letting him follow his pattern back and forth to those chum chunks. 
and hopefully intersecting him just like this on his way up to that chunk. Managed to get a six shot there with that new heavy. Keep him kind of off the, 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 goal, the game on going up is to keep enough drag on that reel to keep him out of the bottom because I definitely can't go all the way down there to get him, but keep him out of the bottom while still giving me enough slack to make it up to the surface. So as we were drifting, we got closer and closer to this big rock in the middle of the ocean. And as we did that, the life got more and more and more. The Rainbow Runner school just kind of created this massive ball around us every time you would drop down to the bottom. And that's that's a really important skill to have as you're, as you're diving something in current. You want to set up way in front of it and then drift into it. And that way, when you dive down, you're not diving down against the current trying to get back to it. You're diving down and you're intersecting it as you are cruising down effortlessly onto the bottom. And that's exactly what I did right here on this dive. This is my first dive on this spot. You know, I shot that Uku earlier in the drift, but now we're getting up to that rock and I don't wanna dive on top of the rock because I'm gonna be behind it with the current. Instead, I wanna drop in front of it and intercept it as I'm kind of effortlessly cruising into it. And you can see the amount of life out here, guys, was truly mind blowing. I mean, any one of these fish is a, is a trophy fish normally out here in our local waters. You get down here to the bottom, there's those Menpachi Aluas, which are basically like the smaller Aluas that are in schools everywhere. Regular size Aluas right there, rainbow runners everywhere. Just an absolute wild amount of life. And it just, I, I couldn't help but just sit down there and appreciate it. And guys, the current was ripping when we first got here, but as we were here, the current died. We caught slack tide, and we were able to spend a full hour dropping on this thing, dropping deep, 120s, 130 feet, all around it, hunting ukus as we had that slack tide. So as I was coming up from my dive, Blake was taking his dive. We had a big group there, so, so it was cool. We were being safe and the water was clear, but Blake does a very similar thing. He's on his way down and he's heading towards that rock. And you can see that giant Uku right there that he spotted, but he doesn't go for the Uku. He doesn't go over there and try and dry dive bomb down onto that Uku. Instead, he goes over to the rock so that he can attract that Uku over to him, get a little bit of camouflage and have that fish, you know, present a high quality shot for him. He's really getting blown around in the current down here, but he, he this fish, he spooks it right here. I think it comes in, bounces off, but he adjusts a little bit, comes down over here, up current, hides, and this thing comes in. This is one of the coolest Uku spearfishing shots I've ever seen. Drilled a 20 plus pound Uku. the reef yeah what a rock huh <laughs> holy crap sick drift <laughs> Woo 
every single drop here was like the best dive of my entire life. Like every single one was totally different. You'd get down here to the bottom and the aluas would come in and the sharks would come in and there were just fish that any other normal day, you would be so excited to see any one of these and you'd be shooting it and you'd be taking it home for dinner. But here we were being so selective. I mean, this was still only day two and we were really trying to hunt those trophy fish, hunt those really good eating quality fish. And it created this sort of environment where we did more dives and just appreciated the, the view down there, appreciated getting to see a part of the ocean that very, very few people ever get to see. And it was, it was incredible to not need to fire that gun every time. I still, I, I need to go back and look, but I think this whole three day trip, I fired this gun less than 10 times. And that is over three full days. And that's just, it's allowed for so much more time to appreciate the ocean and the reef and what a pristine environment looks like without being 100% focused on needing to shoot something every time. One of the coolest things we encountered out there in this crystal clear water was a giant Hawaiian monk seal that wouldn't leave us alone. I mean, we were not harassing this thing. We kept trying to like get away from it. Like it was, it, we were worried that it was trying to take our fish, but it was so cool to get to see him out here in his natural environment, interacting with, you know, his world. I mean, how many human beings does this thing get to see a year? Definitely very few. For whatever reason, as that current died, we had more and more fish show up. You know, right when we first got there, we had a lot of those big, you know, aluas and big schools of menpachi aluas and a lot of a lot of stuff was there. But we only saw that one uku with Blake. And as we spent the next couple hours, like really getting to explore this spot and dive each nook and cranny, it was like a different set of ukus kept showing up. And that's exactly what happened here. I get down to the bottom. I, again, another deep dive. There are, that was craziest about this trip was there were no shallow diving. Like if you weren't a 90, 100 foot diver, like you weren't gonna have a good time on, on this trip. For whatever reason, everything was just hanging out super deep. So I got down here again, 100 feet, just totally enjoying the show, enjoying the view, the sharks, the crystal clear water. And I, out of nowhere, there's my Uku out there. He's coming up through the schools of rainbow runners. I don't know if you can see but that grunting attracts him over to me. Those sharks, it definitely attracts over too. But in that school of rainbow runners right there, there's the Uku. And as I kind of come off the bottom, he kind of comes into me and I'm able to put a perfect shot. He comes to the range, drilled that thing and landed another beautiful Uku. I saw the whole thing and I was like, oh, oh he's gonna, I was like, I'm gonna get a chance. <laughs> I had one more last really nice drop out here on this area. And again, another beautiful Uku came in. You can see him right there. For whatever reason, that current slowed down and like stuff just kept showing up out of nowhere. So we were fine with that, we'll take it. But I posted up down there on the bottom, doing my grunts, which these fish are really reacting to really well. 
and close that gap right there with that heavy, put another shot. Unfortunately, this guy took off and went over the ledge. You can see him dusting up all that blood, and then a Lua actually came out and was really harassing him. I'm not sure what the situation was, but I only got back ahead as the sharks got this one. And from there, we were like, okay, cool. Sharks are, sharks are stirred up. Let's move on out of here. Let's go find another spot. From there we moved out into some true blue water, you know, in that more two to three hundred foot range on the edge of that reef trying to see, you know, if we could find some pelagics. And there was, there's this one Ono came in, this Wahoo out of out of nowhere. I don't, I don't really know why there wasn't a lot of pelagics happening, but this is Blake Cam again. You can see that Ono all fired up coming in there eating chunks of chum. He just ate one and then spit it back out, must have been a bony piece, but he's cruising in and out. And Blake is really cautious with this drop. You know, he the, the Ono game is a fragile one. You know, you gotta you gotta kind of make a move, but you also don't really want to be too aggressive. And he gets this shot here, but doesn't like it. And I don't blame him because I don't like this shot either. And there were there were two more of us getting ready to to dive on this fish. And this fish definitely could have just stuck around and come back in and eaten more chum. But for whatever reason, Ono being Ono, he just took off, never saw this fish again. But when I'm in the blue, I'm pretty much thinking about one thing, and that's how deep is it, and can I get down there and do some real hunting? What is eating that chum outside of our visibility? That's what I wanna know. So while you know some of the guys are going after those Onos and, and looking to see up higher in the water column, I'm being totally relaxed. I'm breathing up so long. We're talking 10, 15 minute breathe ups between dives. And then I can get down there really deep to see what is eating the chum that we can't see. And this was the dream fish, guys. This is this is where it happened. So all trip long, me and Blake were like, where's the 40 pounder? Where's the 40 pounder? Where is the 40 pound Uku? And we talked about this spot for a long time, me and Blake. And we're like, it'll be out here out here on this bank in that two, 300 feet of water, hopefully responding to chum. So that's what I kept looking for. And as I did this deep drop, I get down here to like a hundred so feet right here. I can see him, he's down there below me. It's, a, it's another stud fish. I don't know if he was 20, 30 pounds, but I try and close the gap. I drift in and I actually pulled that trigger right there at 153 feet, 153 feet free diving and you can see that I stuck him pretty good. I spined him, right? A lot line is going out. He's still on the shaft. And then guys, this is the absolute nightmare. I knew that my flopper wasn't engaged. I knew that it wasn't all the way and I'm trying to be as, as fragile as I can with that line. But at 153 feet, there's not a whole lot you can do. And right there, he just did a little twitch, spun off of the shaft and drifted down at the bottom and was gone. I spined him. It really is fish like that and, and situations like this that keep me coming back, but also like haunt my nightmares. You're constantly like, what could I have done differently? Should I have waited to get a little bit closer? Do I need a bigger gun, tighter bands, heavier shaft? You're constantly going through all those situations in your head. But again, at 153 feet, there's not a whole lot you can do. I'm spying them, bro, saddest thing ever. I can see the shaft not go all the way through them. 153. 153? 153. Jesus. After all those deep drops, it was time to go a little bit shallower and kind of head towards our next area. But we knew that we could do another real solid afternoon dive all the way till sunset in that area that we kind of started at. So we head back to familiar grounds and dove kind of like adjacent to but but around the corner and around the corner we found a totally new surprise which was these unexploded bombs or artillery shells or or missiles or something i don't know i'm not a military guy i have no idea what these things are but i do know that this was an old military bombing range so i don't know if that's a bomb or an artillery shell or just a chunk of metal i don't know but these things were absolutely everywhere littering the bottom of this island As it got later and later, the, the ocean came alive again. And what you see right here is an uku going after a crack pipe or a throw flasher. 
and we saw the Uku down there cruising the bottom and, and I think Sky threw his crack pipe and he was up, so he was diving and you'll kind of see him screw this up. There's there's really no other way to put this. You know, he, he does this nice slow drop, it's it's all on him and he's a really deep diver. Sky is, is well over a hundred foot diver. We're only in 70, 80 feet of water. He totally could have gone straight down to the bottom and waited until that Uku came over to him. That Uku's already kind of fired up. He's a, he's a, he's a you know, he's attracted to that crack pipe. He's, he's in, he wants to eat, but he doesn't quite know what it is or he's not ready to commit. But Sky goes down, he drops, and he just totally fumbles it and drops the ball. And we've all been there, we've all done this. Sky's an unbelievable diver, but hopefully you guys can all learn from this. If you can get to the bottom, go to the bottom. You cooked it! That was gravy, bro! That was gravy one! <laughs> always, I, I, I hate that shot, bro. I always go straight to the bottom. Anytime that you can make it to the bottom, go to the bottom, they come right back. And this is a good example of that right there. Sky, his next drop or whatever, had a had a fish get eaten. And as that fish was getting eaten, the uh, Anuku showed up. So his shaft is down there, Anuku is showing up, and then he, you know, he gets his fish back, but it stirred up the whole ocean. And instead of dropping down at that mm -hmm. Uku, I just go down to the bottom. 80 feet's not a big deal. I know that I have a much better chance of getting higher percentage shot, a quality shot on this fish if I'm doing it from the bottom. So I just go down to the bottom, I do what I always do, I do my grunting, I do my dusting, and I wait for that uku to do what he's supposed to do. And he doesn't, because out here at the end of the world, these fish have never seen a human being before, and they do what they're supposed to. You can see that guy, he's cruising back and forth, and then I actually come up on this, which is something that I hate to do. And if I didn't have a real good buddy in clean water, I would, I would not, not do this, and I'm not a fan of this at all, but I came up and then I kind of came back down as I saw him coming straight into me. And he came straight in, well within range, drilled this thing again with that heavy, stoned it, spined it, done, another fish in the boat. What do we got? The jig, he looks black! Like that! Like that! Right outside the cave. What an absolutely unbelievable day, guys. Non-stop action on those monster ukus. Multiple 20-pounders on the boat. Schools of just trevallis everywhere. Tons of rainbow runners. Just the entire area here was alive. And guys, we still have one entire day left. We're motoring right now to some completely new grounds. None of us have been there before. We got another like three, four hours. We're gonna get there late at night, drop the hook, and wake up for another entire day. I hope I get some good sleep tonight because guys, 150 foot drops will wear you out. Heartbreaking on that one Uku. 153 feet all the way down, chasing the chum, spying him with the new gun and just didn't have the penetration, couldn't make him happen. Gonna have to take the gun back to the lab, tell my partner, need a little bit more power. Got a long ride ahead of us, going to sleep, making some burgers, and then we're gonna see you guys in the morning. Well guys, just woke up for our third full day of spearfishing. I'm looking over the side right now where we anchored. I can see that beautiful Hamakua style boulder. We pulled in late last night, so we didn't get a real good view of where we are at, but Guys, we're in another paradise. I'm all suited up, can't wait to get in the water and show you guys what we find in there. So I can't express to you guys how tired we were. This is like now three days in with no sleep. You know, we didn't sleep that whole night driving. We dove super hard the last two days, diving super deep. I can picture exactly how I felt at this moment right here and my legs didn't want to take me down again to 100 feet. But you only live once and you only, I might never get to this area again in my entire life. So you gotta do what you gotta do, rally, and get down there to the bottom, do everything right, grunt, dust, and wait for another stud uku to come in and make a mistake. I don't think I noticed till now, but this is the Blake cam, and I want you to pay attention to his grunts. 
there's a lot more of them and they're a lot faster. And that's gonna bring some of those trevallis in from further away, but also potentially those ukus, those sharks, those other big predatory species. This dive gets down here again to that same kind of boulder field that I got my uku in. This was just a different part of the reef and the moves just kind of levitate up out of nowhere. And how do you pass up on a fish like that? And he doesn't, another perfect shot, and Blake puts another fish on the boat. From there, we went into some serious moo territory. We went in to go, we wanted to go a little shallower for the other guys to get them, you know, some fish. And this was only like 40 feet. And we ended up like in this really weird lava type structure that was covered in moo. There were these big, chunky, six, seven pound moos that were just everywhere. So last moments of the trip, this is the last afternoon, time to get a few more fish. We still had plenty of ice again. I think even with the moo that I'm gonna shoot the rest of this video and the rest of today, I don't think I pulled the trigger 10 times this entire trip. So I get down there, I got my low spot in the reef and that is key. Whenever I'm hunting moo, I wanna do even less than I'll do when I'm hunting anything else. So I get my low spot, I get my knees down, I get most of my body hid behind that ledge do a little bit of dusting, and then it's all about that lunge. You wanna get that lunge forward to kind of close that gap and get within range and take that shot, which is exactly what happens right here. I travel forward a little bit, close the distance, stick a really nice move. You'll see the exact same thing right here. I like those sandy edges for my knees. So anything that's low in the reef, that's what I'm always aiming for. You can see that I got kind of low. I'm looking under that cave right there, but really I want to pop up. And I'm trying to get up and hide my body in that little depression, but get my gun up so that I can, you know, attract those moo over to me, get them curious, and you, you can see them right there. They're all like coming down in, looking at me. I mean, this is borderline cheating because we are at the end of the world, and I guarantee that these moo don't even know what a, pe what a person is. But still, you've gotta do everything right, and those skills that you learn, hunting right out back in Kona, right in the middle of town, where you really gotta work for it, pay off so well when you get out here to these really cool places in really cool target-rich environments. Stuck another beautiful moo there. This one actually got stuck in the cave. And watch this here. I tried to get it out for a second, but then, like a good buddy, Blake drops down and he goes to pull this thing out of the cave, but watch what he does after he pulls this out of the cave. Extracts my fish, real nice and careful, moves that shaft around, I pull it up past him, and then he's already in a little depression there, he's already got a spot, and he's gonna set up and see what else comes towards him. Now, again, in town, here, local kind, sometimes shooting a fish will attract other fish to you, but the majority of the time, if you take one of these fish out of the out of the moo pile, you're gonna struggle to get any more. Clearly, there's about a million here, and these things do not care. So again, you can see that same strategy though. He gets down in that depression, he's keeping that head real still, he's looking forward, and he's really trying to pick out the biggest one in the school. And any of them are good fish, but you're always trying to pick out that one that's just a teeny tiny bit better. And you'll see again, little lunge forward, close that distance a little bit, takes a perfect shot, the dude is an absolute laser, strings a nice move. One last move for me here, and this is a great example, possibly the best one I've ever showed you, of a hiding spot. And when I first came out here to Hawaii, the guys used to tell me, you know, we're not out there looking for a cave to look at, in to find a fish. We're out there looking for a cave that we can hide in and wait to ambush those other predators that are gonna come in to see what happens. So you'll see again that low spot right there in the reef between those two cracks. I come in from the backside, I come in real nice and slow, I set up, 
I do my dusting, I keep my head pointing straight down, I don't wanna look at them, and then I found my handhold. See how that left hand found a handhold? That way that I can adjust my body off of there without using too much energy, too much oxygen, number one, but also I wanna keep those movements as small as possible to not spook anything. So I look up, try and decide which one is the biggest move, which one is close enough, whether I can get it, and if I need to do a lunge forward, I'll do it with that left hand. I didn't that time and was able to stick another beautiful fish. From there, we ended up in a totally new area, exploring a type of reef that was just so, it was so gnarly, so like intimidating. You know, the sun was going down on the end of our third day and me and Blake were still constant, like where's our 40 pounder, where's our 40 pounder? And this was like a big channel between a couple islands that was deep. I mean, I'm at like a hundred feet at least on all these rocks and you can see that massive structure and it goes off. It gets even deeper in that channel out there. And I'm like, man, if I was something weird, this is where I'd live. And what's amazing about this whole entire trip, about everywhere we went, is we didn't see that much weird stuff. There were no lahees. There were no, you know, random deep water species coming up. There was no, you know, hapula. We were all looking for the big groupers out there. There was nothing truly weird. It was just a lot of the same stuff that we see everywhere, but more of it, bigger of it, and dumber. That, that was the biggest difference that we saw in this trip. And guys, we used every single second. I mean, sunrise to sunset, mm, 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 there was no, mm, mm, mm. we didn't drink. We went to, we drank water and Gatorades and coconut waters and we're like, I wanna dive as hard as I possibly can. And then to the last second here, all the way till sunset. And this is the very last drop of the day, dark and spooky. I think we terrified Sky, but I can't thank the guys enough for just a truly unbelievable trip. And Alex, very few guys have the balls to actually pull the trigger on a trip like this. You know, the whole time I was joking and I was like, you know, very few people have the balls and the boat. You know, there's plenty of people with nice boats out there, and there's plenty of people with a lot of balls that would do a trip like this, but very rarely do you find that guy that has both. And Alex, that was you, and I'm so stoked you brought me along on this truly unbelievable adventure. The trusty captain right there. <laughs> Ingenuity. Yeah, can't find the mallet, so we're using a bucket. But boy, that was an epic trip. And uh, as always, it feels great to be back on land. But still, even after a big trip like that, really just want to get back out there on the water. Where are we going next? Cross Seamount. Seamounts, Go. baby. Let's Woo. get it. Miles, we're going. Well, guys, we made it home. What a nail biter of a night. 17 hours running straight all through the night really really low on fuel thank you guys so so much for watching like this video if you haven't and subscribe because i promise you the best is truly yet to come on this channel we'll see you guys next time right here on ryan myers expeditions